It's my real pleasure to be here today on behalf of FDA. Um, consumer education on food safety is a really critical piece of our mission as we're working to assure food safety from farm to table. Um, and the, the piece about education is near and dear to my heart. What you may or may not know is I was an educator for 30 years in the university environment. And I believe that so much of infectious disease and chronic disease can be prevented by good choices in the food and nutrition space. And so that's an area I'm personally very, very dedicated to do, dedicated to work on. So I want to thank the organizers for inviting us here today, and I'm really honored to be here on behalf of FDA. So we have a consumer research group at the FDA. Those are our scientists and the Office of Analytics and Outreach, and a group of them are here today at the conference. They are experts in this area. And they do a lot of research on consumer knowledge, consumer attitudes, and behaviors for a range of food and nutrition issues. These are social scientists. They use scientific research methods for data collection and analysis. We use focus groups, which is a qualitative research method to explore topics and to generate ideas. We also conduct national probability-based surveys to establish prevalence or population estimates of consumers' knowledge, attitudes, and self-reported behaviors. And we also use experimental designs to test cause and effect relationships. Better understanding consumer perspectives and knowledge can in help, help inform our agency thinking, our policy development, and our education initiatives. The one survey you're probably most familiar with is our food safety survey. That's our largest survey, and it's gone back to 1988. So we've done seven waves of data collection for our food safety survey, with 2016 being the most recent iteration. And we often ask many of the same questions so that we can trend data over time. The survey is a telephone survey. It's administered in both English and in Spanish. It's a random sample of US adults, and the sample sizes range from 2,000 to over 4,000, 4,500 uh, survey respondents across these different waves. Findings from our surveys are used in many different ways. They help us identify trends in safe food handling behavior. In fact, our survey is a key input into the US government's Healthy People Initiative. The Healthy People 2020 goal is to increase the proportion of consumers who follow key food safety practices. We also use the findings to explore emerging food safety issues, such as new food technologies or proposals to include food safety in cooking instructions relevant to today's um, uh, remarks. And finally, we use the findings to improve our own education and outreach efforts. Our food safety survey can help us better identify the specific groups we need to target, the particular issues that are most relevant to those groups, and the best way to reach them. Some key points from our uh, 2016 most recent food safety survey are shown on this slide. And just for context, this was conducted in 2016. We surveyed 4,169 Americans, these are all adults, and it occurred between October and January of 20, October of 2015 and January of 2016. So a few high-level findings. Consumers uh, have relatively high levels of confidence in their food handling behaviors, as well as in the safety of the food supply, and they are not too concerned about getting a foodborne illness. They also have a good understanding about the importance of some of the core food safety practices that we focus in on, such as hand washing and washing cutting boards. That's all good news. However, they do still have some incorrect beliefs related to things like washing chicken, and consumers are still not using thermometers to the degree that we would want them to. So here's an example of some of the findings, a few results. I'm going to show you just a few. Um, please note that the full survey results are available on our website, and I'd encourage you to take a look at those. So first, with regard to getting foodborne uh, illness in the home, about half of all respondents thought it was not very common for people to get food poisoning because of the way that food is prepared in the home. And that number has been very constant since about 2006. And it may be hard to read those different years there, but those are different waves of the survey with the three colors of blue bars. The next one is food poisoning in restaurants. Over half of all respondents thought that it is more common for people to get food poisoning from restaurants compared to food prepared at home. Data from CDC tells us that for outbreaks where we know the location of food preparation, restaurants do tend to be the most common location of outbreaks. 
a much smaller percentage of outbreaks is found to occur in the home. However, we have to keep in mind that outbreaks only account for a small proportion of foodborne illness, and much of the foodborne illness that occurs is sporadic or is not able to be linked to an outbreak. The next slide looks at consumers' um, understanding of foods that are most likely to be contaminated. In our 2016 data, consumers considered animal protein foods such as chicken, beef, and shellfish to be more likely to have germs than fruits and vegetables. However, these data were collected in 2016 before the recent outbreaks linked to romaine lettuce and other leafy greens. In our next iteration of the survey, we plan on asking specific questions about lettuce. So we will be able to have a better understanding about consumers' perceptions about lettuce and whether that's changed following the recent outbreaks. The next one looks at what pathogens consumers are aware of. And what we have found in our surveys is that consumers are much more likely to have heard about salmonella and E. coli as food problems in food as compared to listeria and campylobacter. Although you will note the red circle there, that's recognition of listeria that has increased in our trend data from 2010 to 2016. And that reflects um, well-recognized outbreaks involving listeria, such as the Jensen Farms cantaloupe outbreak in 2011, the caramel apple outbreak in 2014, and the bluebell ice cream out outbreak in 2015. Now, in terms of food safety practices, these are our hand-washing results. When we look at consumer behavior, three quarters of respondents say they always wash their hands with soap prepare, before preparing food. And that might be surprising when you hear uh, Carmen Rottenberg talk about some of their observational research on hand washing. But remember that our findings are based upon self-reported data, but the data has been consistent over the years. We think that people intend to wash their hands and are attempting to do so, even though they may not be meeting every step of CDC's hand washing standards. This slide looks at food use of a thermometer um, during cooking. And this is specifically with regard to chicken parts. While the percentage of respondents who said they never use a food thermometer for chicken parts decreased uh, since 2006, it's still way too high. Too many consumers are not using food thermometers uh, in their preparation of food. That's all the results I have time to share today from our survey, but as I mentioned, the first full survey results are available on our website. Simply search for 2016 Food Safety Survey. Now on to some other areas of consumer research. We do a lot of consumer research in CIFSAN. This is a commitment of our new Deputy Commissioner for Food Policy and Response, Frank Yanis, as well as myself. It's a really important aspect of what we do. To support our work in consumer outreach and education, we continue to conduct research into many different topics. Some of those are listed here on this slide. Things around recalls, chemical contaminants in foods, food allergens, calorie labeling on menus, now that menu labeling has come into effect. Um, and you, we are also developing a 2019 food safety survey, as well as we are also doing research and we'll be doing outreach education on other topics such as agricultural biotechnology and food waste. So in terms of the 2019 survey data, we'll of course be sharing that with you when it becomes available. We haven't launched the survey yet. All right, in terms of education and outreach, um, this is also work done by our Office of Analytics and Outreach at CIFSAN, and it's the education and outreach branch that does this work. Two key public health education goals that guide this branch are first, sustained education, focusing on developing strategies and activities to help motivate the public to make health behavior change. And secondly, it's really about partnerships and amplifying our messages. And that's part of the reason I'm so pleased to be here today, because we need your help in getting those messages out to consumers. We have many key target audiences that we target with our education and outreach. Obviously consumers, especially those at higher risk for foodborne illness, young adults, Spanish-speaking individuals, health educators, and you, as you will see, physicians and other health professionals. Um, we focus in on education around all topics, food safety, nutrition, to help FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, to help support our nutrition innovation strategy, as well as many of our old, other goals, including the Healthy People 2020 goals. Our education strategy is really a, a multi-step process involving planning, which are setting goals, doing the formative research, 
development and testing, focus groups and surveys we use, material development and clearance, and finally deployment, which is promotion of the materials that we've developed and those resources and evaluation of our outreach activities. So on to our materials. We have a wonderful resource library at CIFSAN, the CIFSAN Education Resource Library. And this is something that we really launched last year as an online catalog of nearly 300 publications and videos covering food safety, nutrition, cosmetic safety, dietary supplements, as well as industry information. Our new catalog was designed to make this information readily accessible to individuals so that they can have science-based food safety, nutrition, and cosmetic safety information, whether for professional or for personal reasons. The materials are available for download, or they can be ordered if print copies are available. And you can simply Google CIFSAN Education Resource Library to find this and, and access this information. Our materials are updated, and new materials are developed periodically. For example, FDA has developed and posted recently some new information on food waste. We also focus in on spe specific target audiences. In the middle of this slide, you'll see a, a, a thing on pregnant women. We're really trying to reach pregnant women in, with really important food safety information. We have a, a food safety for moms-to-be, which is a health educator's resource guide. We also have a community educator's guide on preventing listeriosis in Hispanic uh, pregnant women in the US. And the final image on the right there is our seafood advice for pregnant women that we issued jointly with EPA. And that's to help make sure that women who uh, are pregnant or who could become pregnant, as well as breastfeeding moms and parents of young children, can make informed choices about the seafood that they're consuming in order to reduce the risk of excess mercury exposure. This, this slide summarizes a few other ones that we have, our Everyday Food Safety Guide for Young Adults. Um, I think it's important to, to reach this audience because data shows that there are relatively few campaigns to educate young adults on food safety practices. And although this population is typically not personally at high risk unless they are pregnant or immunocompromised, they are likely to be current or future food handlers, parents, or caregivers who are primarily responsible for food handling. Um, we also know that data shows that young adults are more likely to engage in risky behavior. The lack of food safety education, role models, or food handling experience increases their chances of improper food safety practices. The next one is our work on food safety in your kitchen, and that's particularly relevant to the topics we've been hearing about here today. And I'm really, support, I'm really pleased to support the partnership's announcements today and the release of its new Safe Recipe Style Guide. And I want to update you on some of our other work that's relevant to this. Research has shown that the inclusion of food safety information and recipes improves food safety behavior during meal prep, as we heard earlier here today. So we launched the Food Safety in Your Kitchen portfolio of materials in fall of 2018. We've promoted these materials through social media during the National Food Safety Education Month in September of 2018. We are targeting individuals who are cooking for themselves and their families, as well as chefs who are writing recipes that will eventually be used by individuals who are cooking for themselves and their families at home. The messages are cook with food safety and, and nutrition in mind, and using easy to follow recipes and culinary tips featuring healthy, uh, healthy inclusions that can include faith, food safety steps as well as key nutrition information. And you can go to our website and access these materials. I'll particularly highlight that we have four nutritious and food safe recipes that you can download. We also have a table next door and you can pick up some copies of some of those recipes with food safety behaviors included. There's also a whole toolkit there with videos, and social media messages that can be used by food safety educators. And finally, in terms of resources for professionals, we target many different groups. Um, the image on the left of the slide, our science and our food supply, is targeted to middle and high school science teachers. And this is a partnership we have with the National Science Teachers Association. This is an interactive supplementary curriculum for use in middle level and high school science classes. Um, we have trained a number of teachers. Those teachers have trained a number of their peers. And all in all, we've estimated that we've reached over 8 million students through this particular program. We've also uh, put out information on, on news for educators. We distribute a quarterly newsletter to 58,000 health educators and other health professionals. You can sign up for that newsletter through our homepage on our education resource library. 
You may also be familiar with the Consumer Food Safety Educator Evaluation Toolbox, Toolbox and Guide, which is a partnership that we did with the Partnership for Food Safety Education. It's to guide, a guide to serve as a planning and evaluation tool with tips, tools, and examples to help consumer food safety educators develop and evaluate their programs and activities. The toolbox is well utilized. In 2017, almost 4,000 individuals accessed the online toolkit. Um, the data provided by the Partnership for Food Safety Education from January to June of 2018 showed almost 1,000 users all told. And the last group I want to highlight on the right side is we're working with physicians as well on education um, and uh, physicians and other healthcare professionals. And so we've put out materials. You can see what physicians need to know about foodborne illness. We've done partnerships with the American Medical Association. Um, we've gotten CME or continuing medical education credits for, 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 for physicians to participate in these programs. So these are all materials that we have to get out there and amplify our message about food safety education across different audiences. So just to wrap up, I hope you will access our resource library, all the, all the tools that are available. Um, you can go to www.fda.gov backslash food and click on consumers and health educators. We would like all of you to help be key partners as we really work to amplify the messages about food safety and nutrition. Um, you can keep up to date with the latest information about food safety by following us on Twitter and on Facebook. And thank you, and I guess I'll move on. My time is up. I'll move on to the next speaker, and we'll be ready for questions afterwards. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Rob Tokes uh, at the CDC. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to join you here this morning. I'm very glad to be here and very glad to, uh, to uh, see you all here. Uh, I'm joined by our communication staff. Uh, who are sta have a booth right outside here, and I encourage you to drop by and have a look at some of our materials. Uh, thanks so much for your attention, your concern, and your advice. Um, before I get started, let me just uh, pose a bit of a rhetorical question for our, our guest this morning, our inspiring speaker, uh, Chef Glick. Uh, uh, Chef, our, our colleagues in Houston are making plans for what may be the ultimate long voyage in a confined space. Um, and I wonder if you might have some advice for them, or may, perhaps they should consult you on, uh, as they plan the trip to Mars. <laughs> and uh, uh, ideas about uh, uh, how to cook in zero gravity may, may benefit from how to cook in, uh, in tossing seas. And I wonder if you might consider for your future the cookbook uh, for the Red Planet as a <laughs> new set of recipes. <laughs> so uh, a piece of important research that we've been doing at CDC I wanted to tell you about is not is we hope the first results will be available uh, and online later this, this year is a survey of uh, what people say they are actually eating, their exposures to foods including risky foods that we have conducted periodically since the 90s with the support of uh, our colleagues FSIS and, and FDA. This is the FoodNet population survey of exposures, of food exposures and other exposures relevant to uh, 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 diarrheal infections. Um, and uh, after a break of about uh, a decade, uh, this is now ongoing. We're going to be wrapping up data collection uh, uh, this summer and hope to be posting at least the first round of results of how often do people say they eat this or that food uh, and uh, some of them being the risky foods. Well, uh, 2018 was a year of many outbreaks of foodborne problems, including many different foods. Romaine lettuce was front and center, uh, but there were also a, a, a dry breakfast cereal surprise and uh, a, a Southeast Asian trub called kratom, which may or may not actually be a food. Uh, we, we saw an increase in MDR salmonella, multi-drug resistant salmonella types, uh, associated with chicken and turkey. There were a lot of different issues. I think uh, partly there just were more outbreaks last year. I don't know that it's going to be like that this year. But partly we're also starting to see the impact of the wider use of a new laboratory method for DNA fingerprinting the bacteria that make us sick and implementing this tool in the public health setting to find, investigate, and control outbreaks. In 2019 now, we are moving forward to make this new method we call whole genome sequencing the new standard 
uh, in public health laboratories around the country for PulseNet, the national network we use for tracking foodborne bacteria and detecting outbreaks. The older method that we've used in labs for over 20 years will be replaced by whole genome sequencing. <clears throat> and as of yesterday, all, all the state public health laboratories in the country have been equipped with the, 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 the necessary equipment they need uh, and all but five have a new software package that lets them tie it all together and uh, start uh, co working collaboratively to identify problems. And 23 of our 50 states are now fully trained and certified to start using it for the main foodborne germs. Uh, the food labs that FDA has and works with are already fully prepared to use this method and FSIS is on board as well. So uh, we soon will be transitioning to this whole genome sequencing as our primary standard method. This method I want to talk about a little bit because it's going to be, it's the biggest change I see in the way we do foodborne surveillance uh, in uh, my career. Uh, this provides much greater precision than the old method does. Uh, and uh, we can take two bacterial strains in the lab and really uh, do a, a deep genetic dive, a geek out, that uh, lets us see just how closely related they are. And measuring that degree of relationship in detail, uh, we can look for clusters of closely related strains or surprises that relations may reveal. Think of it as sort of 23andMe for bacteria. Uh, and we can investigate them. The presumption is that the closely related strains are more likely to have a common food source. Perhaps a breakdown in the kitchen facilitated this to, 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 to spread more, or, or, or in a processing plant, or other problems. That it takes an investigation to show just what was the issue that allowed it to come through to consumers. By talking to the sick people about what they ate, it may become clear that they nearly all ate one particular thing. Our standard epidemiological methods apply uh, more often than by random chance alone. Uh, and that the one thing can be traced back to where it came from. And perhaps there is a, 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 a way to solve the outbreak and lead to specific action that can stop further transmission. And those are the situations when collectively we tell the public, you know, uh, here's a particular tightly defined product that's an issue or a specific recalled food to avoid, uh, a very direct kind of communication that's an important part of stopping the outbreak. But in addition, this new precision means we can tie individual cases together um, to be a group of closely related strains. We can consider not just the strains that are identical, but their first, second, and third cousins. Uh, biologists use a specific word to describe this group of related strains. They draw on a Greek word, uh, the, talking about the tree of life with many branches. They use the word clade, which is the Greek word for branch, to describe this family or group. We are starting to find these bacterial families, re tightly related groups or clades, that may cause similar outbreaks repeatedly or that may cause individual cases that don't all occur at the same time or place, but they are of concern. In other words, this new precision is starting to blur the old line between a simple point source outbreak, all in one time and place, and the background of sporadic cases that are going on all the time. So we anticipate finding and solving and stopping more of those focal outbreaks, which are important, busy times for public health investigators and communicators. In addition, we'll be looking for the broader patterns in the constant background <coughs> of sporadic cases. When a, a new strain appears, when a group of strains that is highly drug resistant, or, or a, a clade, let's say, of these related strains starts increasing, we may start investigating them even before they cause a classic explosive outbreak. And when we provide information about these, <coughs> it won't be as a specific direct recommendation to avoid one product or one recalled food type, but it will be to emphasize the general advice to the consumer around a specific category of foods and to the industry itself. I think finding and investigating these strains may be very important to improving <coughs> food safety and prevention in the long run. Here's a recent example. A group of strains in one serotype of salmonella 
called Salmonella infantis, which has been around for a long time, but a, a group of strains closely related genetically and of concern because they're extremely antibiotic resistant to 10 different antibiotic agents. This, this appeared first in uh, 2012 when we saw a case, another case, another case in this country, all in people returning from overseas, from Latin America, from Peru, in fact. Two years later, it appeared the same, similar related strains appeared in the monitoring samples of chicken here in the United States taken by FSIS, small numbers. And then we began to see cases in people here who had not traveled. There seemed to be many different related types. In fact, using our old standard method in PulseNet, we got up to 18 different subtypes, which felt a little diffuse and a little hard to tackle. But it turns out by whole genome sequencing, they were all closely related. In last year, uh, PulseNet, uh, using the old system, found a specific subtype that particularly increased. And our outbreak investigation group, along with FSIS, focused on an acute investigation of that one type. They found that almost everyone ill had eaten chicken, but they'd eaten a variety of different brands and types, whole birds, parts, pieces, ground chicken, even raw chicken pet food was involved. The FSIS investigation identified strains in chicken from 58 different uh, uh, slaughter plants. And again, it was many different brands across the country and across the, uh, the spectrum of production. <clears throat> Not, it wasn't just one single brand or one single slaughter plant that was the issue. Rather, it appeared in chickens coming from many different farms and this, this group of multidrug resistant salmonella must be present on many farms. It, that, that's what we concluded. Now, had we been just strictly using our old logic, uh, this would have been 18 different patterns and, and, and it would have stayed there and, and it would have been perhaps a, a lot of different patterns, a lot of different product, very difficult to proceed further. Because we knew there was a unifying genetic element to this, they were all closely, they were all related by our genetic methods um, we proceed further. So while this investigation did not lead us to one focal problem in one processing plant or kitchen, rather it points to a broader system-wide problem that is spread from live chicken production through to the consumer. So having established this, sharing this information, discussing it with the regulators and with the, with the chicken industry, and finding that cases then very recently of that one type we were tracking had decreased substantially, we closed the acute phase of our investigation into the source of the strain. Of course, this means that educating the consumer is, is more important than ever, cooking and handling chicken properly, washing one's hands uh, uh, at appropriate points, and cutting board hygiene are more important than ever. And, of course, the pathogen reduction measures during processing and slaughter are important. And in addition, these salmonella still have been getting through from the farm to the consumer. So the investigation leads to additional questions. <clears throat> How did it get into the chickens? Why is it persisting and spreading on farms? And most important, can control measures on farms help prevent these infections? Is that an added piece that needs to happen? Um, so we don't, we don't give up at CDC with these problems. We do expand the focus and point to where prevention measures need to be improved. It is up to all of us to keep, this, to keep up the concern and to demand safer food. And as we enter this age of whole genome sequencing-based surveillance and investigation, I predict we will learn a lot. Uh, our public health investigators will find more and perhaps smaller focal point source outbreaks that need attention to investigate, control, and stop. And that will continue to help make our food safer. In addition, we'll be better able to define broader, slower moving problems that I could call the clades of concern. Uh, if you think that might work as a, as a phrase, or we'll find another one if, you, if we need to. Uh, closely related groups of bacteria that are more spread out over space and time and represent problems in the system. We can identify problems spreading through animal production and the environment we can grow, we, the sand, the environments that we grow our plants in. For all these problems, the general advice we have for consumers at the end 
is more important <clears throat> than ever. We need to underline, food by food, the consumer advice that is, that is so important to help uh, uh, prepare the food safely. Our final common goal, from farm to kitchen, needs to be on reducing the number of people who get sick each year from the food they eat. Thank you all for your efforts. Good morning, and uh, thank you for having me here today. This is actually a really fun opportunity. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Main and Dr. Tokes and I are often on the speaking circuit around the country at various conferences, um, but we don't often get the opportunity to share the same stage and sort of talk about very complimentary messages. Um, as many of you probably know, our agencies work very closely together and also with our state health partners really on just on a daily basis. Our staffs are in constant communication, constantly brainstorming and thinking about ways that we can improve uh, the safety of food in this country, uh, improve the consumer behaviors around handling food in this country, uh, and as a result, I would say that we have the safest food supply in the world. Um, so, you know, as, we're, as we think about consumer demand for information, I know you all are going to be talking a little bit about that uh, this week, and, and you all see it out where you live and work. There's more and more access to information that consumers have. Um, I think it's great that we had Chef Glick open today because it sort of showcases how uh, reality TV is, is really playing a huge role in how consumers interface with food. Uh, I, don't, I have three kids, and they are totally locked into the Food Network at all times. Now, if I could get them to cook a little bit more, that would be better. But they love watching the food being prepared. And so it really plays into this idea of where does my food come from, and um, how am I handling it at home, and um, can I trust the safety of it? And, and what's really ironic is that a lot of the questions around safety aren't what we would consider the four core values. People are associating safety with, um, with preferences, with consumer preferences around different kinds of labeling claims. And so I think this is a really important point in time to be thinking about how can we harness consumer interest in the data, in the, in the um, consumers are more and more interested in, in outbreak investigations, and honestly it's just getting more media attention, which is important as regulators because we want that information to be getting out to consumers so that they're safely handling their food. But how can we as a group really be harnessing uh, that sort of interest in food in order to promote the, the safe uh, food behaviors? So I want to talk to you today about something that we are working with our public health partners at FDA and CDC on, a uh, year-by-year holistic approach to doing observational studies. So you heard Dr. Main talk about surveys that have really been done since the late 80s. These are phone surveys um, in order to ask consumers questions. So it's all self-reported data. Um, we want to see if, uh, you know, we don't have cameras on our consumers or, uh, you know, every day, 24 hours a day, but if we did have cameras on them while they were preparing foods in a kitchen, what would that look like? So in year one, which we just completed last summer, we've sort of been on a big media campaign uh, around the results from the, the uh, observational study that we did, and, and many of you have heard some of those outcomes. Uh, we were studying food thermometer use, so the important step of cook. If consumers are armed with information on how to use a food thermometer, how to place a food thermometer, uh, when to take the temperature, will they, and if they have access to a thermometer in a test kitchen, would they use it and would they use it correctly? So primarily what we were looking for is in a test, in the, in the, we had a control group that didn't get any messages, that didn't get any messaging, um, and then we had a treatment group that received a food safety video. So they received a food safety video ahead of the study, and then when they arrived, they received an iPad uh, with, the, with the messaging about how to properly take the internal temperature of a turkey burger. Um, what, they were, what they thought that they were there to do is to test out a new recipe. So a treatment group uh, received the, the food safety messaging on how to use a food thermometer, and the control group did not. What we found is, um, which, is, which is, was really fascinating to us, and this is done with RTI and with North Carolina State, and you can find more information about it on our website. Um, but what we found is that not only did uh, the participants not use a food thermometer, but they didn't, they didn't wash their hands. So 
um, when you think about, when you're thinking about as educators how to educate consumers about safe food safety behaviors in the kitchen, uh, we tend to be focused on things like, well, they have to cook their food to the right temperature, and that's right, but if they're not washing their hands, it might not matter, right? Because they're spreading this around the kitchen. So we had the ground turkey, we had uh, a harmless tracer microorganism in order to track how that was moving around the kitchen. And it was, this, it was a harmless uh, tracer that travels the way salmonella would in a kitchen. And consumers had thousands of opportunities to wash their hands in the kitchen, right? They're handling the packaged turkey, they're making a salad, um, and are they washing in between those things? They're taking the turkey out of the wrapper, they're grabbing for the spice containers and shaking it on, they're putting the spice container back down, they're not washing their hands. Um, so even where participants may have washed their hands when they started, uh, consumers were not washing their hands throughout the course of movement around the kitchen, and they were not exhibiting those safe food handling practices in the kitchen around washing their hands. So there's, you've heard a lot about 97, 97% of the times that consumers should have washed their hands, they didn't wash them properly. I'm gonna to get to that on the next slide. But I think that this slide is even, is even more important in that only a third of the time did they even attempt to. So forget about successful attempts, only a third of the time did they really attempt to. And I think this is really important, back to what Dr. Main was saying, nobody wants to admit that they're not washing their hands in the kitchen. So when you do a phone survey, I think that people will say, of course I wash my hands, right? But what we know by this observational study is that when they should be washing their hands during that meal preparation, they're not. So if we get to the next slide, and you know, CDC has, um, has five steps for washing hands. You all know this. You have to wet your hands. You have to lather them with soap. You have to run them under, you know, you have to, you have to lather them up for 20 seconds, rinse them off, and dry on a clean towel. And so this slide illustrates that um, the vast majority of people who attempted to wash their hands at the right times didn't scrub their hands for 20 seconds. Uh, but again, if we go back to this slide, only a third of the time did they even attempt to do that. And so I think that that's really important. Okay, so um, let's get back to did the, did the participants actually, um, well, I'll go back to this one, although it doesn't give my bar graph, but that's okay. Um, did they actually use the thermometer? So that's really what we were studying, what we ended up observing, and what really made a lot of media headlines was the hand washing. But we were, what we were actually studying was the use of that food thermometer. And so 48%, um, oh, I'm sorry, 66% uh, in the control groups, that was, those were the folks that didn't get the, the, the video lesson, and 27% of the treatment um, group did not use a food thermometer. So even where, and on the, we know on the self-reported data from FDA that consumers also say that they do use food thermometers in the home. I think what we found in the kitchen where there was a food thermometer and the participants um, maybe didn't receive any, didn't receive the messaging, maybe they didn't know it was there, uh, but they didn't look for it either. So the, the vast majority of those people were not using the food thermometer. And then the, for those who received it, you know, we had over 70% of them attempted to use the food thermometer, which I, which I think is, is, a, is a good news story there. Um, however, when we, talk, when we think about whether they were using it correctly, 46% um, of the control group and 27% of the treatment group did not cook the turkey burgers to the uh, safe internal temperature of 165 degrees. So a couple things going on here. When we think about um, cross-contamination across the kitchen, uh, separate is obviously a really big step, and it's something that you all as educators are out there you know, sort of preaching to folks every day. In this study that we did, nearly half of the participants spread that tracer organism to spice containers. 6% uh, of them, when they were preparing the salad, they might have touched the meat and then touched the salad. We found the tracer organism on 6% of the salads that were prepared. That's really significant um, because even if the participants were cooking their burgers to the safe temperature, they've now spread this around the kitchen. And as many of, of you know, salmonella can live on surfaces up to 32 hours. So someone else unsuspecting is going and turning on the faucet or opening the refrigerator door or handling the spice containers. They may have perfectly clean hands, but now they're contaminated and they're going to go eat with their hands. And, and if they don't wash their hands in between, that's going to be a significant risk. So these are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about. And as we're, as we're talking to consumers, I know that it's difficult to get folks to understand the risks associated with food, and for, for in my world, with meat and poultry in particular. 
We do have the safest food supply in the world, and I think that as a result, uh, American consumers do have a sense of security and that they feel, you, you all have heard this, well, I never got sick. Well, I leave my, my grandmother left the meat out on the counter to thaw. So we're really hopeful that this sort of, um, this, this, these observational studies that we're doing, and we're also doing web surveys uh, in partnership with FDA using that using their self-survey questions, doing some web surveys that we can track that information between the two agencies also, just getting more data points that we can be putting together really to showcase the science and the research that says uh, what, what can happen and how these organisms can move around the, the kitchen I think will really be critically important. Uh, so we have in our, in our the, the year two, which is the observational experiment that's going on right now, we're studying um, the washing poultry. So we were looking at uh, participants who, in particular, in response to a survey, said that they do wash their poultry. And then we're taking a treatment group where they're told, uh, where they're shown a video on why you shouldn't wash your poultry. And we're going to have better data um, to support that when the, the tracer organism splashes up onto surfaces, um, if they're not you know, cleaned and sanitized, uh, which people are not, you know, you heard Chef Glick talk about the, 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 all of the work that goes into on a boat sanitizing surfaces, uh, but people aren't doing that in their own homes. So to be able to, to look at that and, and find out how that contamination is moving across the kitchen, um, I think will be very important. And then there's also uh, the component about evaluating FSIS social media messages. And this is really true across all the observational studies that we're doing. How is our messaging resonating with consumers? Because if it's not resonating with them or we're not accessing consumers, we're not accessing the young adult population that Dr. Main talked about in her presentation, um, then we need to be looking at how we can change those messaging, that messaging um, in order to, to reach a wider segment of the population. Thank you. So we will now take questions um, from you of our panelists, of Dr. Main, Dr. Tokes, and of Carmen Rottenberg. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up to the microphones. Um, I will start off with one question, and probably Dr. Tokes is the best person to answer this, but I welcome any of you to answer it. Um, consumer confidence is, is always a challenge for those of us who work directly with consumers. And a question that we get often is, our foods, is our food supply less safe? And we're seeing foodborne illnesses, we're seeing more outbreaks, we're seeing the illness numbers are not decreasing as we had hoped, as the goals we had set forth, are, you know, indicate. And are foods less safe or are we just better at finding them? And, and how, do we, how do we communicate that as food safety professionals? Well, thanks very much for uh, thanks very much for the question. That's a that's a, it's a good one. Um, in in the past, uh, say uh, ten years, even further back, twenty years, I think we have seen some important decreases mm -hmm. in certain types of infections. Mm -hmm. E. coli O157 infections, for instance, came down importantly since say uh, before the turn of the century, uh, and listeria infections have decreased. Um, we, uh, even Campylobacter has decreased somewhat from sort of the baseline back then. Uh, but it's absolutely true that with Salmonella that has been quite fixed around a certain rate that we track in our surveillance system called FoodNet. Um, and uh, uh, should we be grateful it hasn't increased is, is one question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that there, it, it's telling us that there are major challenges remaining. Uh, one thing that's happening that is, is making the food safety world a little more complicated is the ability of clinical laboratories to diagnose infections in people who are sick is changing. And there are new diagnostic methods that are uh, faster and more universal so that uh, if I'm sick I may walk into a, a consulting clinic or an emergency room and, and uh, someone may say, ah, let's find out what it is and uh, 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 use a test that can identify 22 different foodborne pathogens in one, in one go from one specimen. And the results of that are sometimes a little complicated to interpret. How about if I have three different 
test signals that are positive of three different pathogens. Now, which one caused the illness? That's a head scratcher sometimes. And that includes things that, it includes germs that uh, laboratories wouldn't be routinely testing for before, like Vibrio or Cyclospora or Yersinia. And those tests, that's now part of that routine panel of diagnostics. So we are seeing uh, testing that may be an increase, just an increase in the likelihood of being tested if I walk into a yeah. clinic. And that is a reason to drive some numbers up. I'm, we're, we are working out how to adjust for that and to adjust our models. Uh, so far, I think, I think it's mostly an increase in testing rather than an increase in the actual numbers of infection. Um, but that's, that's one complicating feature of life right now. Um, and the second is that I think there is change in the spectrum of pathogens that's out there. And if we just look at salmonella, there actually have been some very important decreases in some of the most common types of salmonella, uh, including ones that may have been associated with poultry, particularly in the past, like typhimurium or Heidelberg serotypes. And those have declined very sharply. Um, and others, unfortunately, like the Infanta serotype mm -hmm. that I was talking about, have appeared apparently coming in from other parts of the world and have, have now established in, in the industry. So I think we have to be alert to these changes, and those changes are going to require changing up the prevention strategies a bit. Yeah, and can I just add a little to that? I, I think Dr. Tokes talked about the importance of whole genome sequencing, and that is really game-changing in how we're doing these food safety investigations at FDA and in partnership with our, with our other federal partners. And what's, what's happening is we can now pick up outbreaks that we would have never picked up even, you know, in the last decade with this new technology. And as an example, I mentioned the Bluebell ice cream outbreak, a listeria outbreak. Um, we identified in partnership with CDC on this one, 10 people scattered around the country that all had the same outbreak pathogen strain. And like, how would you have known that in, in previous years? And then we were able to link that to the actual production facility at Bluebell using the techniques of whole genome sequencing. So what we, we say constantly at FDA is that our ability to detect these outbreaks has increased very, very rapidly. And at the same time, we are preventing new outbreaks, and those are two countervailing forces. So consumers are going to hear about more outbreaks. We are deploying more and more whole genome sequencing. Our databases are growing uh, in the, the genome tracker databases. We have more and more data going into those databases. And what that means is there's more robust data to identify the next outbreak. So I think it's a key message to consumers. We want to get out there with those important food, you know, outbreak and notices using social media, as Carmen Rottenberg alluded to. We use that a lot. So consumers are hearing more about it. They care about it, but they need to understand that that's protecting them in ways that they would not have been protected in the past. So where you can help us get those messages out, I think that's very important. We will have our trend data in our food safety surveys to really, our consumers feeling that the food supply is less safe. It is not less safe. It's that we can pick up things we couldn't have picked up in the past, and you can help us get that message out. Thank you. We do have some questions from the audience, so go ahead. Hi, I'm Sharon Davis with Home Baking Association, and my question has to do with uh, family consumer sciences education at the secondary level. That's my profession, teacher, junior high, high school, and I see an absolute opportunity. I've been using Fight Back as well as um, your toolkit for a long, long time. I love these tools, these resources. My question has to do with how we can go ahead and advocate for more family and consumer sciences at the secondary level. That concerns me greatly. Even with Perkins 4, we'll have a culinary track, which is good, but 25% of students taking these courses before they graduate as, as young adults is not enough. Mm -hmm. So where's our advocacy going for food skills in management of home food? Yes. 
Maybe I'll start. I, I think it's an excellent question, and some of us were talking about this at dinner last night. Even in culinary schools, um, there's sort of a, a, a lack of information about food safety and food, pre and, and food handling, um, or there's misinformation. Uh, and so I think there's definitely a space for that. Um, you know, Secretary Purdue is going to be rolling out uh, Don't Fear Your Food campaign. And this is one of the, um, one, it should present an opportunity across USDA uh, with the way that we interface with schools in order to be providing that information. But you're absolutely right. I mean, when I was in middle school and high school, I had to take home economics in order to graduate. Food safety was a part of that. And kids don't have that. My kids don't have that in school today. And, and I agree completely. And the other part that we've been trying to do, as you know, is develop those materials we understand that there's competition in the curricula, right? You know, we talk to science teachers, we talk to school teachers, everything is competing in the curricula. So by getting in materials that can integrate and meet those needs, that's the, the science in our food supply curricula to try to meet those needs. So we will try to do our part to create those resources that you can then, you know, leverage into the curricula. But we realize it's competition in the curricula. So how can we best, you know, how can we best take advantage of the materials we have to get that space in the curricula? I want to thank you for those materials. I'd say the advocacy part right now would be critical. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Brun? Yeah, Christine Brun. I see an increased trend for people to be in touch with their food and particularly an interest in having backyard chickens. And often these chickens, you know, they use the eggs. I don't know what they do when the chicken gets old and dying. I'm assuming they're burying it. But some of them are also very pleased that their chicken is walking among their lettuce oh, yeah. and picking all the bugs. And my concern is this trend being reflected, uh, although it's in the home and maybe not a restaurant, so we're less likely to get public uh, attention, but is it reflected at all in increased sporadic cases of salmonella, perhaps related to an eggs or perhaps related to homegrown produce that is contaminated by the chicken's proximity. Do we have any data to support that? And are there efforts in education to, to advise people um, to how to reduce these risks? Well, uh, I'll, I'll start with an answer, uh, Dr. Bruin. Uh, the backyard flocks uh, of America are certainly uh, growing and uh, 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 now, I think, main a, a, a common feature of our lives. Uh, I have a neighbor with 50 chickens in their backyard, which uh, the local uh, coyote population has noticed. <laughs> and that's in the middle of Atlanta. Um, I, and uh, uh, we have seen outbreaks, certainly recurrent, repeated outbreaks of salmonella infections that are related to keeping of uh, backyard flocks, getting them from specific hatcheries. We've been working with the hatcheries and the distribution chain on what they can do to start the process correctly with chickens that are not contaminated, chicks that don't have salmonella in the first place, and uh, uh, instructions that can go home with a chick uh, from wherever the point of sale is about basic hygiene and keeping the chick out of the kitchen, for instance. The chicken, you don't want the chicken walking around in the kitchen either. Uh, and hand washing and a lot of basic hygiene around uh, the management of chickens. So we're seeing, uh, we have seen a lot of illness and outbreaks that we have uh, linked to backyard flocks. Um, your question is really sort of that ultimate cross-contamination question of does, uh, does the, what, what the chickens have contaminate the environment that they're near or among? <clears throat> I don't think we've uh, seen that and I'm not sure we'd be able to say, oh yes, it was the lettuce, it wasn't the fact that the same people were also feeding, handling, petting, kissing the chicken itself. It might be hard for us to distinguish that. Yeah, and from the FDA perspective, you know, the FSMA is all about prevention and produce. We have a produce safety rule that's trying to help people understand the steps they need to take in order to assure the safety of produce. And that's targeted across the spectrum, you know, large farms, medium, small farms. Um, we have a lot of materials. We've been working hard in the education outreach to try to help people understand um, the steps that need to be taken. And it, it's like in the kitchen, there's a 
you know, core set of steps that you need to take, the same thing when growing produce. You know, the same things apply, that if people are handling the produce, they need to make sure their hands are clean, and there has to be hygiene in the fields if you have pickers in the fields, and many of the exact same concepts apply. So we're trying to get out a lot of education. We put out a guidance document for produce safety with a lot of fact sheets to simply get that message out to folks about how to grow produce safely, because we see, you know, we know the trends. A lot of people are growing it at home and may not know the important food safety practices that they need to make to make sure it's safe. And these are ready-to-eat foods, so we can't count on those cooking steps in many cases to take, you know, to take down these pathogens if they're in these foods. Maybe uh, I could, if I could just add one little bit, uh, I think this issue of uh, uh, infections that we get from the pets that we love is, is, is front and center for our One Health office, and we have a website uh, uh, that focuses on healthy pets, healthy people, and uh, a, a good deal of rather specific advice about uh, uh, managing backyard chickens, including a recent Facebook Live event we hosted out of uh, one of our epidemiologists' uh, backyard chicken coop. Yeah. And turtles and, and other species. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And, this, yeah. and I know a lot of the extension departments also have a lot of information on this topic on um, local farming, um, urban farming, backyard flocks. So, and it, the resources from the agencies would be great um, to collaborate with in terms of having the extension tie in with the federal resources. But you guys already do a great job educating locally about this topic. Nicole and Pat Buck. Go ahead. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm Patricia Buck with the Center for Foodborne Illness Research and Prevention. And uh, I first of all want to congratulate and Praise, applaud FSIS for its consumer behavior research. I'm very, very happy with that. And I'm hoping it progresses quickly because I think some of that research information will help us determine how to revise the safe food handling label for the meat and poultry products. So, yes, thank you. Uh, I guess my question is a little larger, though, and it's because of my concern of the growing problem with antibiotic resistance and the fact that, you know, we really are a global food supply on many levels. And Dr. Tokes, you identified, I think, the problem we have to get onto the farm. I don't know of any way we can get on the farm to do the types of um, surveillance so that we can help identify what interventions need to be put into place. FISMA might have a few opportunities for us. But what I think we really need is the leadership from the CDC to come out with a pretty strong statement about the need to do on-farm interventions, research whatever you want to call it. So do you have a plan of, that you're working with now that might shed some light or hope to us about how we're going to proceed with that aspect of you know, food safety? Uh, glad to address that question. I think my partners here on the stage may also have comments. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 Pat Buck, uh, for that. Uh, yes, I think a lot of the issues that we're dealing with uh, have origins in, in animal production or in areas that are affected by animal, environments that are affected by animal production. Um, and uh, there is another federal agency that has primary responsibility for uh, uh, the health of the animals and the plants, too, the, and that's the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, uh, uh, APHIS. Um, we, uh, uh, we think it's important to uh, engage with APHIS and their resources. Uh, we made a trip in December to uh, Fort Collins to talk about this with uh, the APHIS leadership uh, and to uh, point to areas where uh, future collaborations could really be helpful. They have a system of doing uh, systematic studies and surveys on farms um, that uh, we, we think is a very important system and needs to include these uh, uh, food safety issues and antibiotic resistance issues uh, routinely. Sometimes they do. 
Um, so that's one step forward, is working with APHIS. We have renewed our liaison relationships with APHIS and uh, uh, our, uh, so that we have an APHIS uh, staff person at CDC who is hearing and connecting with what we're doing uh, so that there is no, no, uh, no loss of information between our agencies. I think another really important factor in this is that uh, the parts of our food distribution system that that, that, find, that, that find sources, that, that, that purchase uh, meat, uh, poultry, uh, produce, they have their own uh, uh, standards for what has to happen before they will accept it. And uh, we've seen initiatives in the private sector for setting standards for what needs to be done before they will agree to purchase uh, uh, and, and distribute and then sell. Uh, uh, poultry or, or, or other products. And I think that that private sector initiative is, is also important and helps underline the importance of starting things out right with the right processes on farms. There's a lot more to be done in that arena though, of course. I, I may be able to just build on that. Um, you know, uh, Pat, we've, we've uh, updated the salmonella performance standards for poultry and and at the same time, CDC um, has, has started doing a lot more in terms of communicating in real time when there are outbreak investigations going on with more publicly facing web postings. Um, and I think as a result of those two things sort of in tandem, that's put pressure on the industry in order to address things back from before the slaughter. I know it has because we're seeing all kinds of new interventions on farm. Uh, and there is this, I, I understand what you're saying from a regulatory perspective that you think that we should be doing more, but I just want to highlight that as regulators, there also can be a market, the market can end up pushing if you put certain standards and, and benchmarks in place for the industry that in order to meet that, and there's certain things that they have to do before that. So I just wanted to build on that. And I can build on that too. And, <laughs> and first of all, thank you, Pat, for your commitment to food safety. I mean, she's a, she's a visionary leader in this world and we all interact with her on a regular basis. So I wanna thank you first. Um, second, from, from an FDA perspective, um, a lot of this work on antibiotic resistance comes out of a different center. It's not my center, it's the Center for De Veterinary Medicine at FDA. And one of the things that they've been working very hard on is to control the use of medically important antibiotics for humans mm -hmm. so that they're not being used for growth promotion in animals. And so that has been a big step forward. And basically what it says is you can't be using these important antibiotics for human use for animals unless a veterinarian says that has to be done to, to meet the health needs of that specific animal. So this is not my center, mm -hmm. but I will point you to some of that work on prevention. The second piece is, um, with the advent of whole genome sequencing, we get a lot of information out about these pathogens when we do whole genome sequencing. And one of the tools that that now gives us is a better understanding of antibiotic resistance. And so we have new tools to try to better understand what's happening out there. So I think as is with so many of these complicated issues, it's requiring all the agencies to use what tools they have to try to combat this problem. It's a global problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. And, you know, and we're doing what we can, and for folks who are interested in the, the Center for Veterinary Medicine part of FDA, I'd refer you to their website for what they're doing for antibiotic resistance as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. But um, one thing that I think would be extremely helpful is for the CDC to come out with a strong recommendation, like you spoke about the non-use of antibiotics in animal husbandry. We need a duration limit for the use of tetracyclines and other antibiotics used, and yet we cannot get that. And part of the reason we can't get it is we don't have a justification. Justification can come from the CDC in either a report or a guidance document or something. Thank so, you very much for thank the suggestion. You. Okay. All right, next question. Hi, uh, I'm Glenda Hyde from Oregon State University Extension Service. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm an associate professor of practice and field faculty, so um, I'm uh, uh, have a concern here for you. Um, the consumer food safeties that uh, surveys results that comes out. If you guys can get that out just a little bit earlier, uh, it'd be really helpful for us to be able to transmit that information to the public. 
um, if we can get it out by, or if you guys could get it out about mid-February, that would give us a chance to train our staff, um, who then train volunteers. Our master food preserver training start in April. Um, and then we would be able to give the uh, public up-to-date information. Uh, they love having the, you know, those percentages uh, and, and information helps motivate them, I think, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, in the past years, some of that information doesn't come out until Food Safety Month in September, and we've lost a whole year that we have the, when the public's interested in getting that kind of information. Um, in the spirit of kind of uh, sharing current information, uh, yesterday I was in Washington, D.C. at a program director's meeting, and just because we were just talking about chickens, one of the projects that was shared was from the University of California, Davis. And a veterinarian there has uh, gotten a project started to study the effects on uh, backyard chickens, um, the eggs from the backyard chickens in areas where the wildfires have occurred, and all the heavy metals uh, and other pollutants that come down um, the pike with, uh, whether it floats down in the air or um, is runoff from uh, the watershed through uh, some of the firefighting foams and stuff that are, are spread. So I just wanted to share that with you and let you know that maybe there's a funding opportunity for these guys for the future because they have a really monumental task ahead of them. But um, anyway, I'd be glad to talk to you off mic about that. Thank you. Do any of you want to address the timing issue? I know there's a lot of constraints on timing when it becomes available, your clearance processes. I'm not sure if there's anything that could be done about that, but um, that's a great point to, to make. Yeah, I think that um, I think that that's helpful feedback. Mm -hmm. I guess I have a question about why February, March. Is there something that is uh, like universal to the extension? Why that timing is important? And we can probably gather that information fr through the partnership and, and see if, if there's something critical in that. Yeah, um, I think that but, I, we'd, I think we'd definitely be open to mm -hmm. hearing more about what the okay. needs are. <laughs> answer that right now. The, um, our food preservation uh, season starts um, at that time. You know, we're gearing up and doing updates mm -hmm. and um, training our volunteers, and then um, people really want to learn about food preservation when everything's getting ripe in their gardens. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the time, you know, or whenever yeah. harvests come in, mm -hmm. or when they can get the food cheap, okay? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. okay. thank yeah. you. Any information like that is helpful, but there are multiple factors in when the information becomes available. We definitely don't want the agencies or any researchers to hold information longer um, than necessary when it is ready to publish. Um, there's always kind of when it's ready to go, it's ready to go, and we want the information. Um, and I know you want to get it out there. So, but you know, just communication and awareness is really helpful with that perspective. Any other questions? Okay, one's coming to the microphone now. Uh, this is a pretty, just a simple question and an observation. I'm with Cisco, and I'm I'm um, Rich Beatty from Cisco, and uh, I go into a lot of the new universities and a lot of the new hospitals, and you know, in the washing hands, the signs are there. Employees must wash their hands. Right outside the cafeteria is the restroom. There, we've done a great great job teaching our kids about going green. So they got the air blowers and no hand towels to touch the sink, to touch the door, they go out to the salad bar, they spread it all back around. So it's almost useless washing your hands. What are we doing to combat that feel of it? So it <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's a, I, I just wish at my kids' school that they would make them wash their hands before they eat lunch. It just absolutely drives me crazy. Uh, my kids go to a school in Washington, D.C., and uh, they all keep hand sanitizer in their lunch boxes because the school does not have them wash their hands before they go to lunch. I think hand washing in schools um, I, across from grade school through university level, uh, I think that the, there's a, a whole host of, of um, things that could probably be done. I don't know if that that in our agencies we're going to be able to tackle that, but I always think it's interesting when um, CDC has done research in the past about uh, what's the dirtiest part of the of the bathroom or the or the or a, a kitchen and things like that. I mean, it's just education. It's education and the, and the with the administrators. I don't know if you all have anything to add to that. 
No, I, I, you know, I can take that back to our folks who are here and listening in terms of what we can do on an education front. Um, you know, that's not the only challenge. And, and Carmen made me remember, you know, talking about what's the dirtiest thing. I mean, one of the one of the dirtier things that we're concerned to right now is cell phones. Cell phones, yeah. Um, you know, is that the cell phones may be contaminated and they may go in and wash their hands and they sit down to eat lunch and they're texting and they're doing yeah. the whole thing the whole time. And so there are multiple opportunities following a hand a hand washing to get recontaminated. And so um, that's new information that we've gotten as part of our food safety survey about the concern about technology in the kitchen. And we all do it. We all, you know, use iPads in the kitchen and recipes. And, um, you know, that's a new, a new vulnerability that we're working on to try to get some new education needs out there. So times change, trends change, and we need to be abreast of those and get out there with appropriate education and outreach. Yeah, and I didn't mention that in my slides, but we actually tracked that tracer uh, microorganism onto the cell phones and the iPad that was used with the recipe, and so the, the devices were all contaminated too. So it's a good point. I, so, I just say that yeah. you raise a, a, an issue, a general question, I think around uh, environmental contamination mm -hmm. and, and cross-contamination is immediate consequence, but there's also the spread of, say, antibiotic resistant strains through the environment. And uh, this, this is an area in general that needs a lot of work. It needs a, 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 a good deal of in attention and directed research. We have a very small environmental microbiology shop that's starting to look at just how much resistance is there in the rivers and lakes in our environments uh, that are important in agricultural production, but also that we may be exposed to in lots of other ways. So I want to end with giving them the, the final word. I want each of you to, to take you know, 15 seconds or less um, and tell the audience your, your take home message for them, whether it's you know, a, a web address, um, one key point that you're, you're working on that you want them to remember from today, anything you want. But just a quick you know, final thoughts, Dr. Main. I would say um, f for you, um, head to our CIFSAM resource library. I, I actually looked through all 300 to see what was on there in terms of our resources. There's a tremendous amount of information on there that hopefully will be helpful to you. And then in terms of being helpful to us, if you see gaps, if you see needs, if you see areas where the federal agencies can help play a role in developing materials and in gathering data and doing research, please feed that back to us as well because we would like to be informed by what you're seeing in the trenches on education um, back to us. Okay. Dr. Tex? Uh, for CDC, let me uh, say we, we welcome your help. We need your assistance in balancing two sets of messages one around outbreaks when they occur and what specifically consumers can do to protect themselves. And other one is more general messages that are important all the time and that when an outbreak is quote over, that doesn't mean that there's no need for general uh, protective measures that consumers need to be conscious of and applying all the time. Can we use outbreaks to emphasize that? I'm sure we can, but the off signal doesn't mean that everything else is not necessary. Carmen? And I would just say um, go to foodsafety.gov, which is a tri-agency collaboration and has a lot of the materials that Dr. Main was talking about um, and also additional information from other agencies. And also, as we're um, going through these observational studies, this five-year track, I'd like for you all to follow along with that. We did a media training. We've got folks from our media team here this, this week. Um, and we did a media training for about a dozen of you. This is something I'd really like to sort of take on the road to equip you all to better handle requests with larger media outlets to get the information out to a wider segment of the population in your states. I want to thank all of our federal partners for their, their collaboration, their insights, the research. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. <laughs>